any of those, no matter who they voted for last fall, Americans who love the same team can bond over football. No longer possible, sadly. Now even the country's final nonpartisan refuge has been invaded by politics. On Saturday, the president tweeted that NFL players who protest the national anthem ought to be fired. And as if on cue, the protests intensified. In London, players for the Baltimore Ravens and the Jacksonville Jaguars kneeled in contempt of the Star-Spangled Banner while standing respectfully for God Save the Queen. In Chicago, the entire Pittsburgh Steelers team stayed off the field for the anthem, save for a single player, an Army veteran who defied his own coach by walking out. His jersey, by the way, is the single most popular football-related piece of paraphernalia on the Internet right now. In Washington, D.C. last night, virtually every player on the Raiders sat in protest as a military honor guard carried an American flag onto the field. Now, the sight of pampered millionaires giving the rhetorical finger to the country that made them rich is obviously disgusting. So it's no surprise that in stadiums across America, fans booed when they saw this. The left responded today pretty lamely, saying players have a First Amendment right to criticize their country. Of course, nobody really contests that, though free speech lectures are a little hard to take from the very people who routinely shut down the political speech of their opponents. In any case, it's not the point. Just because something is legal doesn't mean you ought to do it. The Constitution also protects your right to, I don't know, scream obscenities at nuns. But it doesn't prevent the rest of us from judging you for doing it. So what are these protests really about? Well, some players claim their core complaint is police brutality. In which case, fine, protest that. Learn the facts, make your case, propose solutions, run for office, try to make the country better. But no, that's too hard. It's easier to follow the demagogues and attack America itself. You'll win plaudits for bravery on Instagram. So why is this a big deal? Why is it, in the end, dangerous for this country? Well, for the same reason we sing the national anthem in the first place so often and stand for the flag, used to say the Pledge of Allegiance, all those other slightly silly civic rituals that liberals have long despised and sneered at. Why are they important? Because in the end, love of country is all we have. We aren't like other nations with a homogenous population and a shared history and religion. Increasingly, we don't even have a common language. So shared belief in America, the country, is the only glue that binds us together. Why are Vermont and Mississippi in the same country? Because people in both places love America. What happens when they no longer do? Many have accused the president of using the flag controversy as a diversion for more pressing topics like the threat of North Korea or the failure of his health care initiative. And as a political matter, that may be true. But it does not change the inherent significance of what you just watched last night at the game. Because when our elites attack our national symbols as if they're worthless and loathsome, something important, something monumental has changed here. If the people who've benefited most from America despise it, and increasingly they do, where does that leave the rest of us? Burgess Owens is a former NFL player. The Reverend Michael Faulkner is a candidate for New York Comptroller. Both of them once played for the New York Jets, so they're well situated to comment on this. Both join us tonight. Uh, thank you both. Reverend, I want to go to you first. Um, and ask if you understand why this is all a little hard to take. Nobody can test the First Amendment right of these players to do what they've done. But to watch the richest, most celebrated, most pampered people in America attack, not police brutality, but the country itself, can you see why people find that so very disgusting? Yeah, it, 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 you know, they don't know how to express their anger. And, when, you know, and, and I, I push back a little bit, Tucker, on the richest, most pampered, because they've had to go through a journey to get where they are. So yeah. they've gone through some things to get where they are. They're not pampered. They weren't born uh, of means. Many of them were born into uh, low-income families, etc. So they've gotten where they've gotten because of their talent, their God-given ability. However, but, but hold on, but hold on. That, well, let me stop you there. But isn't that the whole point? And you're right, of course. What you just said is totally true. But isn't that the whole point? In America, people from a low station can wind up being some of the richest and most pampered people in the ab country, as they are. Absolutely. And listen, as an American... I have a responsibility to challenge power, to challenge authority. However, we're talking now about the setting of it. The setting for an NFL football game and the stars of the game kneeling down before the game is not the proper setting for them to express their political angst and their, 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 their opposition to uh, what is going on outside of 
uh, or, or, you know, in the, the inner cities. And right. it, it, just, I, it just takes away the political legs, and it's offensive. And to be honest with you, I think we ought to talk about having that conversation, talking about giving them an opportunity to do something different, because <laughs> not standing for the national anthem would, certainly wouldn't be something I would do. Uh, right. I would, but, I mean, these guys have plenty of... Look, I mean... They can say every word is recorded by dutiful scribes in the sports press. So it's not like they have no uh, outlet. So Burgess Owens, I'm wondering why the United States government should be subsidizing this. If these guys hate the government, a lot of the stadiums they play in, I would say the majority are funded by taxpayers. The Pentagon spends hundreds of millions a year advertising at NFL games in the stadium and on broadcast. Why should why should they be doing that? If these guys hate America, why are American taxpayers picking up a lot of the tax? Well, I, I don't think they should be, and, and I, I think that uh, the America, the, the the free market is going to take care of that in itself. My, my concern with this whole process is what the stand the flag stands for. When I stood on the sideline, I remember getting teary eyed at points because I was so excited about being there, so proud to be part of that yeah. process. But I also had grew up during a time when seventy percent of black men were mentors to us. They were in the home, doing the things they need to do, teaching us that this country is a great place to be and to grow in. We now have come to a point because of liberalism, because of the process of what democratic policies do, 70 percent of black men do not stay around. They don't have these parents and these fathers to tell them what they should be proud of and, and, and how they should stand up and, and, and for this process. So this is, not a, this is not a void. We're dealing with we're dealing with an ideology that, first of all, bans God has destroyed the black family in the 70s, which we led the country in terms of, of our strength of our family unit. They have destroyed our history. No one even knows about how strong the black American history was. And now they want to take away the pride of the country. And I think it's a bridge too far. I think this is the one thing that as Americans, we might disagree. Mike and I might disagree in terms of, of how they what they can do in the field, but at the end of the day, we love our country, and we're going to make sure we stand against those who, 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 who take away the hope of our kids. And that's well, what I these think, that, I think that's right. And, and I mean, Michael Faulkner, isn't that the whole point, that these are people who are revered by kids and right. by lots of Americans, and shouldn't they be, look, America's flawed, nobody argues that it's not, but that the <laughs> whole enterprise is illegitimate and disgusting, which is what they're saying, and the flag is an object of contempt. Shouldn't they be telling us the opposite? Because it's obviously true. And, and taking a knee, they don't get a chance to talk about their, they don't get a chance to talk about their issue. First of all, they, they need to get up and do something about, they need to not just protest, but they need to get up and they need to be part of the national conversation to make America America better, to make their communities better, to take their responsibilities, just like Burgess was talking about. But secondly, you know, I thought about it after I looked at, again, at what Pittsburgh did. Maybe we should not allow them on the field unless they can stand in honor of the flag and the national anthem. Maybe they should not be, maybe they should be restricted from the field unless they plan to honor the flag and honor the national anthem as all the fans do in the stands. Well, this that's a great, I mean, that's a great suggestion. By the way, Burgess, isn't that consistent with the way the NFL operates? I mean, if you want to wear orange socks on a team with white socks, you can't. The owner no, says the team says you. you can't. That's exactly right. Why don't they hear? Well, let's take it a step further. The NFL corporate office right here in, in New York City. How about the employees on lunchtime decided they wanted to uh, demonstrate? They'll find it. They'll come back and find out that their the, the desks will be vacated. Right. <laughs> and at the end of the day, this is what's happening. The liberals at the very the top elitists, they are using these our, my, my race. They're bringing misery to my race and then using this misery to make sure they keep their power. Uh, we need to make sure, number one, there's two things. We need to make sure that we're standing against corporate elitists, liberal elitists like the NFL. I will be boycotting every single team that does this. But we also have to, as black conservatives, get into the black community and let them see yeah. what, the, what, the, what the Democratic Party has for years done to them. It's okay. not a white American problem. It's a Democratic, black and white elitist problem. And, and the third thing the battle, you need to do is run for something so right. I can vote for you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Gentlemen, well, thank you both very okay. much. Thank All you, right. Tucker. Thanks. Appreciate All it, right. buddy. Well, everything in America must be about racial politics now, so it's no surprise that CNN's Brian Stelter and Jim Acosta were both wildly speculating that Donald Trump doesn't really care about the flag and the national anthem and our civic symbols. Instead, he's just a racist. Watch. There is an unmistakable racial element to this story, and that's why I come down on the side of covering this and covering it big. The awkward subtext is a question we asked a few weeks ago on this program. Is President Trump a racist? Why is it that the president was seeming to go after African-American athletes over the weekend? He went after Colin Kaepernick at that rally in Alabama Friday night.
Tom Brady did not make it here to the White House when the New England Patriots made it. There were no angry tweets from the president directed at Tom Brady uh, or other athletes. I don't think it's a stretch to say that is a bit of a dog whistle that is being played out there. The larger question, of course, is how did Jim Acosta wind up on television? But for the meantime, we're going to content ourselves with some of the smaller questions with Joe Concha, who writes about the media for The Hill and joins us tonight. Look, if you're a reporter, you probably ought not to be speculating about people's motives because aren't they fundamentally unknowable? Like, how could Jim Acosta know? what can the president I, means. Can I answer osmosis on that? Because you could <laughs> look at all of President Trump's tweets on, on this topic, and right. it's, it's all out there. Race is not broached once. He's also verbally talked about this as well, and you don't see race broached anywhere. But since we have, again, reporters and pundits that last month were playing mental health officials when it comes to analyzing the president's sanity, now apparently we're reading minds as well as far as that go. But, but just to answer Mr. Acosta when he said, why weren't there any angry tweets at Tom Brady uh, when he didn't show up at the White House for that celebration. Uh, Brady's mother has cancer, and Tom wanted to spend time with her at that time. That's why he couldn't go, and that's why the president didn't respond, but Jim Acosta doesn't report that. Yeah, and by the way, I was at the Redskins game last night and watched the Raiders kneel for the national anthem, and a bunch of them were white. You know what I mean? And by the way, I think the league is overwhelmingly like 70 percent African-American players. Mm -hmm. So is any attack on the NFL a racial attack? Is that what they're saying? Well, there appears to be this tick with our political media that all the time we insert a racial component to stories that don't warrant them whatsoever. And let me give you another example with another story. Brian Fallon is a former uh, press secretary or a spokesperson for Hillary Clinton. He's right. now a political analyst for CNN. And he tweeted, and I asked your producers to put this up because I want to make this an educational experience. This is what Brian Fallon tweeted out today. Trump's racist neglect of Puerto Rico is threatening lives. It's time to start caring about the crisis there. So that's what we're dealing with now, that when a hurricane hits a U.S. territory, and we've responded, I think, pretty pretty well, like we did with Harvey and Irma, it's racism that's working its way into this. But you were at that Redskins game last night. Uh, good thing you watched, because not a lot of people did, Tucker. Uh, that was the lowest rated week three NBC Sunday night telecast since 2006. So that's when you know that this isn't just, well, you know, some people are boycotting there. They really don't care. No, this is a real problem for the NFL right now if those are the numbers that we're seeing. And I think this is correct. That the, and it, it may be wrong, but I think it's right that the teams with the most players protesting the national anthem and the flag were more likely to lose last night than to win. Oh, that's an interesting, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't comment on that. I, I didn't research that. Uh, but I do know that the NFL, Tucker, is awfully hypocritical here when it comes to free speech. Now, you may remember last year that, that horrible situation in Dallas where a sniper took out five Dallas police officers. Yes, I remember and well. Several, right? The Dallas Cowboys wanted to wear a decal, a little one, on their helmets to honor the Dallas Police Department with the Dallas Police Department logo. And the NFL said, no, you can't do that. And when D'Angelo Williams, a running back, wanted to wear pink cleats for the entire season because he wanted to honor his mother because she died of breast cancer, the NFL said, no, 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 you can only do that when we're running our campaign in October. And when Avery Williamson wanted to wear 9-11 cleats that he made himself, red, white, and blue stars, very fashionable, uh, the NFL said, no, you can't honor 9-11 victims. So the NFL seems to be picking and choosing its spots sure. here in terms of what kind of free speech you could have and when. But overall, Tucker, I talked to a lot of people yesterday. I was out and about. I didn't put a microphone in their face, just conversations. The sentiment on the ground is that people People agree with the president on this one. They don't necessarily agree with the way he presented himself, because right. you know, he's saying sons of bitches and so on. But uh, it, it completely contrasts what we saw in the media bubble, and not just cable news, but on ESPN sports media as well, which was universal condemnation of Trump. This is like the 2016 election. The conditions on the ground, right. what people feel, is completely different than what people are thinking in New York and Washington. Well, that's ex that's always the case, and they yeah. don't they don't actually care what people outside New York and DC think. No, Joe, they only care you. what each other think. Yeah, it's totally right. Trust yeah. me, I live here. Well, he's been holding, thanks, Joe. He's been holding down the 10 p.m. slot for years. Tonight, he makes his triumphant return to 9 p.m. We are honored to have the great Sean Hannity join Parker. us now. Sh Sean! I'm so literally trying to, I need help. I'm only starting my 23rd year here on the Fox News Channel next week. I have no <laughs> idea what to do, no idea what to say. There's nothing in the news today. Do you have any help? I do. Actually, I just got word about 60 seconds ago that Alejandro Villanueva, he was the player who, you know, the Army veteran, three, three, exactly right, three tours, walked out, is now saying 
that he did so by accident, and he has apologized uh, for embarrassing why? his team. He was the hero. This is uh, this guy's. I think he won the Bronze Star. This guy served three tours of duty in Afghanistan. I saw that, I, and then I saw his coach attack him after the game, and I'm like, really. Really? This guy, he tells a story about losing some of his platoon mates that is so inspiring, it's pretty amazing. So, look, I want to congratulate you. You, you have been a great friend. I'm just praying you give me a great lead in every night. Um, <laughs> oh, we're going to try. <laughs> no pressure at all. It's all and on we, you. And we have a live handoff. I just heard that's this right. five-second delay has been eliminated, so we'll be able to speak uh -oh. at the cusp of 9 p.m. every <laughs> evening. I'm excited. I'm excited you're back, ready to do battle. This is going to be awesome. You know, I said this on The Five today. Um, I, I never thought I'd be the last person standing. If you watch the early days of Hannity and Combs, Tucker, it's so bad. I am so bad. It is so humiliating. I was on it in the 90s. Are, I remember that well. in the early days. Yeah. And I feel blessed to be here. We, you know, it's, it's hard. I mean, we lost three quarters of our primetime lineup. You have been a big part in, in keeping this network strong. Uh, our entire lineup, I'm friends with everybody here. I have no, I'm, I just feel very blessed. But I will say this. It is so imperative for this country in this time where we have a media institution that is trying to disrupt and destroy this country and destroy this president and delegitimize him, that there's got to be some other voice out there. And, you know, you wait, you, so you, wait you, you don't think that everybody in the entire media should be singing off the same song sheet? You, you think you know, there should be some diversity in America's media landscape? Is that what you're arguing, Sean? How dare you? Know, you? I'm, I'm kind of saying it, and I know a lot of these media guys are hoping I'm going to fail and fail miserably, and they yes, want me they to are fail. Hoping, they are uh, hoping that. Yes, they I've been are. in a few cable wars. You know, the best thing that ever happened to me, I'll tell you a quick story of my entire career. In Atlanta, when I had only been, it was my second professional radio job in the early 90s, I went up against a legend, the best, a guy by the Neil, name of Neil Bortz. When I came to New York, I went up against Bob Grant, who also was a legend. Yeah. When I started in cable, it was me and Alan against Larry King, Geraldo, and Brian Williams. I'm used to a good fight. And so I'm really excited that... Uh, is, let's just say, oh, I got to tell you one last thing. We have two massive, massive things we're going to say on the air tonight about upcoming guests. Well, what are they? Well, I'm not telling you. You got to have to tune in at nine. I, I'm getting so used to saying things. I have to tune in at nine. So tease don't and tell. Is that what you're saying? I am saying that I love you, Tucker. But at some point during <laughs> the you, at Sean. some point in the next hour, it's going to be revealed. But you have been amazing. Uh, the you. audience has been so loyal to you, and you have been able to fill one of the biggest gaps there ever was in cable. And you've done it with dignity and grace, and you've been successful. And I'm, I'm really proud to be a, a, a friend and a colleague of yours. And you're well, gonna, thank you. you are going to die about so my, uh, by the so end my of producer this next just hour. said in, just said in my ear. Yeah, you sound like if Connie it, Chung if, saying that to Newt Gingrich, just between uh, Newt Gingrich's mom, just between you and I. I'll never forget that. He just said, and, if the rumors are true, it's a big deal. So I'm not even going to speculate uh, uh, about spe you having the content. Let's put it tonight, that way. So I, far, I nobody has it. But okay, I'm going to sit in the studio after it's done with our cameraman and watch breathlessly like golden retrievers staring out the window. I'm not saying when I'm going to announce it either. <laughs> I'm well, not saying. the whole hour. Listen, this wait. is an amazing time. I, we love our audience. We're going to serve them every night with news and information and hard-hitting opinion. You do great debates that they will not get anywhere else on television. And I never would have thunk it that I'm the last man standing. I will tell you that. <laughs> I love it. That was not in the prediction papers on October 6, 1996, when I started. I'll never forget it. During the Dole campaign. Don't 41 minutes from Google now. That. It's embarrassing. <laughs> it's so humiliating. Congratulations, Sean. Right, See Tucker. you in 40 minutes, man. Be sure to tune in 9 p.m. Sean Hannity at a new time slot. Up next, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all humans are created equal. Wait, what? Up next, we'll tell you about the school in Arizona that has taught students a gender-neutral version of the Declaration of Independence. Our founding documents boulderized by the PC cadres. Also, a wave of hurricanes killed dozens of Americans. Some activists say the real killers were global warming skeptics. They want them charged with murder. We'll talk to an actual scientist about that suggestion. Coming up. 
Well, the Declaration of Independence is justifiably one of the most famous documents in human history. A history, by the way, that it helped change forever. Thomas Jefferson's immortal words echo through the ages. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, except at Salk Elementary School in Arizona, where students are being taught that Jefferson was a sexist bigot. During a lesson for her fourth grade classroom, a teacher at that school crossed out the word men and told her kids instead to recite, all humans are created equal. Because she's apparently wiser than the author of the document. Victor Davis Hanson is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution out in California and a wise man himself. He joins us tonight. So, Professor, why should we care? I sense this is a big deal rewriting one of our founding documents but tell us why we should care about this well anytime a person tries to change language it's usually because the reality is unpalatable in this case the idea that we're supposed to identify by our superficial appearance or our race or our tribe rather and that should be essential to our character rather than incidental so that's an agenda that nobody really wants to buy into so whether it's human or mankind or overseas contingency operations or man caused disasters in the case of not wanting to talk about Islamic terrorism or right. illegal alien becomes migrant. When you start to see words change their meanings, usually it's an effort on the left, it's because they're not empirical and they have a message that nobody wants to buy into so they try to do linguistically what they can't do politically. That's a brilliant. That's a brilliant analysis. It's in a, what you're saying is that it's propaganda. They're distorting reality in order to change outcomes. Yeah, and they're also ignorant. And classical languages always have two words: one for male and one for male and female. That's called mankind. Anthropos and on air in Greek and homo we're in Latin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when people say mankind, they don't think of testicles. They think of all of us together. Everybody knows right. that. And what a waste of time that when students are half educated as it is with these studies courses, they really should be looking at the essence of the declaration of, of the equality. All men are declared equal. That was a radical thing to say in the 18th century. Instead, we get caught up on the, an agenda of some half-educated activists, sort of like what we're seeing in the NFL. That, but it's not, that that's not, actually the not, you said that that was a radical concept in the 18th century, and obviously it was, but it's also a radical concept now. I don't think the modern left thinks everyone's equal. I think they believe there's a hierarchy based on race and sex and sexual orientation. Well, they, yeah, they have to, because once the agenda of equality of result was largely achieved, equality of opportunity was largely achieved, we're, we're humans, we're particular individuals, and when we don't quite get become equal, even though the opportunity is the same for a variety of reasons, the left comes in and says, we're going to insist on a quality result. Just right. give us enough power and money and, edu and influence, and we'll do it for you. And we see that. I mean, there's no space, Tucker, anymore that we can find a refuge from politicalization. I know. Comic I know. books, Emmys, Oscars, everything is political because the left is trying to do... Uh, what it can't do at the ballot box. It's that's exactly, that's exactly right. Foundations. The rest yeah. of us are in church or sleeping and they never sleep. Victor Davis Hanson, thank you very much. As <laughs> thank always, you. great to see you. Thank you. Hillary Clinton's latest explanation for her defeat, women don't recognize all the sexism in the world. Up next, we'll ask a Democratic strategist whether this theory makes her defeat any more explicable than the prior explanations did. What exactly does it mean? Stay tuned. Hillary Clinton has found a lot of people to blame for her defeat in the presidential election last fall. Jim Comey, Bernie Sanders, Jill Stein, those dastardly Macedonians in their content farms. Most people sort of scoff at those explanations. So now Hillary has a different one. She's accusing women of sexism against themselves. Watch this. I think it's about the um, stage that uh, a young woman uh, finds herself at any particular point in time. Uh, actually, the research is pretty clear. If you're a young college educated woman and you are starting off in the workforce, uh, you are pretty much at wage parity with your counterpart, a young male uh, college graduate. By the end of your 20s, you no longer are. Once you decide, if you do, to be married, to have a family, you fall even further behind. You don't yet understand all of the sort of invisible signals and attitudes that are at work that can hold you back. 
Christy Setzer is a Democratic strategist, president of New Heights Communications, and she joins us tonight. Christy, it's great to see you. It's great to be here. Hard to imagine more patronizing explanation. So here Hillary Clinton loses the majority of married women, women who are out of their 20s, just the majority of them, women who've had the experiences she just described. And she's basically saying, you just don't understand what it's like to be born in America. Well, they do because they are, mm -hmm. and they voted against her. I don't think she's patronizing married women. I think she's actually specifically talking to the Bernie supporters who are in their 20s who didn't support her. Um, and look, don't get me wrong. I don't think it's a good idea to uh, to tell people who didn't vote for you that they were wrong. I don't think that's actually an excellent strategy. But I will say as a woman um, who is... 40 years old, that this actually spoke directly to me and my lived experience, which is that, yes, uh, for the early stages of my career, I did believe that I was given every opportunity. By the time I was in my late 20s, I did see the men who had exactly my same level of experience getting tapped for much bigger jobs than very few of the women. So I, I do think that if you haven't ever experienced that, then you don't actually connect with Hillary on that point. You don't necessarily see her as somebody who has had a lot of sexism thrown at her, had a lot of different challenges thrown at her, and yet she's come out on the other side, she's still fighting. She's well, still I can slinging. see it spoke to you, but it, did. it didn't speak to the majority of women in your position because they actually didn't vote for her. That's what I found so striking about right. this. She described this life progression, and when you get to the end of it, you'll know the truth. Well, the women who actually got to the end of it know the truth are like, ah, I don't want any more Hillary Clinton. Right. But what I struck me even more, though, was her contention in this interview and many others that having a female president is substantively different from having a male president, and sure. we need one. And my impression was we were supposed to believe that the differences between men and women are so minuscule mm -hmm. that you can actually change your sex just by saying so. You don't need surgery or anything. You just say, I'm a different sex, and we have to agree that you are because the differences are so small. She's saying, no, the differences are so profound that you'll have a different country if you have a female president. How does that work? No, I'm serious. How does this work? Uh, you're conflating two very different things. You're conflating. No, uh, same thing. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about the idea that you want to vote for somebody who has understood where you're coming from, right? And whether that person is male or female, you want somebody who you think can look at your life and say, I get it. I understand um, you probably have the same fears, worries, um, hopes and aspirations that I do. And I think that she is saying, and I believe this, that um, women have a lot of things in common and often have a lot of the same experiences, hopes, fears, aspirations, et cetera, in a way that, frankly, I don't believe that Donald Trump would understand where I am coming from, where I've been, where I would like to go. And yet, again, the majority of 69-year-old well, yeah. grandmothers voted for Trump. But here's my question. Sure. What are the specific qualities yes. that would make a woman a different and better president than a man? And I want to warn you that this is a minefield of stereotypes here. Sure so as is. a liberal, you've got to pretend that no generalization is allowable about women. <laughs> so how are you going to answer my question? I will, I will answer your question by telling you what my experience has been and what spoke to me about her campaign. There was a moment um, in which Hillary Clinton sat there giving testimony on Benghazi and it came to be the 13th, 14th hour of her testimony. She had exhausted everyone else in the room. She answered question after question after question. She was proving yet again that she was smarter than almost everyone there, that she could actually answer it. She had not just stamina and skill and smarts, but she basically faced everyone down. And I think that women across America in that moment um, said, good but how for you, that? good okay. for you, lady. So, so she's, she's got enormous stamina. I've always thought that about uh -huh. her. And she's pretty tough, except when she's playing the victim. But what was, fe what was specifically female about this? this uh, she hit this the whole campaign. It's a glass ceiling. I'm a woman. By the way, I'm a woman. Woman yeah. here, woman, woman. Well, who cares? I don't understand why it's important if men and women are basically the same. I don't think women, men and women are. So, basically what qualities the same. do women have that. that don't that men don't have that make them better presidents? I, again, I believe that in the same way that you might believe that African Americans are facing different things each day than white men are experiencing, that. It's not too big of a leap to think that women are facing different things each day than men are. Say, for example, the universal experience of women. Let me finish. But that's not the argument. That the universal experience that women have of being in a meeting, saying something, you know, the point's not heard, a man says it, and then suddenly says that's a great idea, right? These are small and subtle things, right? But these are very, very relatable experiences um, that 
you, you know, again, that if you are a woman and you listen to Hillary Clinton, you say, I get it. I've been there. And frankly, yeah. she's going to look out for me in other ways because she understands what I've been through in this way. Yeah, I sort of understand. Again, women didn't feel that way. But final question is, do you think yes. women have better judgment? Do you think they're stronger under pressure? I mean, like, is there some quality yeah. of being a woman yeah. that makes you a better president potentially because she uh, kept yeah, suggesting that I, I never figured out what she was talking about and I'm not against a woman president by the way I'm not arguing that I, I, just I never... do I think that w women are sort of as in the way that anybody who is not typically in a position of power women are more self-aware of the dynamics that are at play right women yeah. are more self women are more aware of you know both the ways in which women treat men men treat women blah 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 blah, blah right so I think that that necessarily, particularly in the roles yep. that she's had as Secretary of State, where you have to experience diplomacy, understand where other people are coming from, I think that makes her inherently more empathetic. And okay. um, there's lots of reasons to okay. go for. I would say women seem to have a lot of power, certainly in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, thank you, Christy. Thank you. you. President Trump expanded his travel ban, saying it is needed to keep the country safe. In response, the mayor of London compared him to ISIS. Nigel Farage here to discuss that coming up. Chad, North Korea, and Venezuela. In response to these new restrictions, the mayor of London City, Khan, took the moderate position that President Trump is pretty much like ISIS. Watch. Because what you're saying is not dissimilar to what Daesh or so-called ISIS is saying. What do they say? They say there's a clash of civilizations. It's not possible to be a Muslim and a Westerner, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, uh, the West hates us. And you're inadvertently playing their game Nigel Farage is the former, le former leader of UKIP, the UK Independence Party. He has spent years pointing out the dangers lurking around the world, and he joins us tonight. How'd this guy wind up mayor of London, Nigel? And is he for real? Uh well, I'm not sure. I mean, I think he's lost the plot, hasn't he? I mean, how on earth can you compare Trump to ISIS? ISIS is a barbarous, murderous regime that inflicts countless misery on as many people as it can. Uh, and, and Donald Trump, whether you like him or not, and maybe the mayor doesn't like him, but Trump actually is standing up, defending our Judeo-Christian culture, uh, and, and is doing it in the face of extraordinary opposition from judges in America, from people people in his own party, uh, but honestly, I do think Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, is, uh, to put it mildly, wide of the mark with these comments. They are ludicrous. What does the rest of the UK think when they look to London and they see this guy as mayor? I mean, it must be, I mean, this is the seat of the British Empire. This, this was a really impressive place for hundreds of years, and this guy's running it? Yes, I mean, I, look, let's be frank, you know, he is not particularly high calibre. Uh, he's been elected in a city uh, that is now increasingly a Labour left of centre city. Um, I, I mean, do remember that a lot of people in Britain are nervous, uh, are a little bit politically correct, are scared perhaps of saying some things, but it's also worth remembering uh, that over the course of his political career, Sadiq Khan himself has made some real mistakes in terms of who he shared a platform with. You know, he shared a platform with some guys uh, who've turned out to have some Islamic views that are pretty unsavory. Uh, and and I, I honestly, I honestly, I think, I think conservative Britain looks at what Sadiq Khan says, frankly, shakes their head and examines their shoes. <laughs> That's very British of them, I have to say. So do you see across Europe, as you look what just happened in Germany, and as you look what is happening in Spain, cut on independence, is, is the continent coming apart? It looks that way a little bit from here. Yeah, in many ways it is. I mean, look, you know, you've heard the story over the course of the last few months. The populist revolt is over. Macron has won in France. Merkel is back in Germany. Uh, but the truth of it is, what you saw happening in Germany yesterday was for the first time in decades, uh, a party that is unashamedly German, a party that is talking about their own identity, running their own country, deeply skeptical of being run from Brussels, getting 90 seats in the Bundestag. So yesterday is a big day in Germany. And and for those who comfort themselves that Macron won in France, well, in the first round of the French presidential election, nearly 50% of candidates voted for secessionists. So the message here is we may not have had the big seismic shocks of Brexit and Trump, 
that we had in 2016 happening in 17. But believe you me, the momentum, the movement of those that say we don't want to be elected, uh, by, run by unelected supranational cabals, that is right. still growing, that is still gathering pace. And, and I believe me, Tucker, in 10 years' time, this European Union, as you see it today, will not exist. That's right. And, and this entire internet, finance-based international orders on its